Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Health and Wealth Podcast with your hosts, Tim and Carter. What's trending in Richards? Carter Wilcoxon, founder of CSI Financial Group here with my co-host and former wealth advisor, Tim James, founder of chemicalfreebody.com and your new health advisor. This is the show where we reveal the connection between physical and financial abundance. Hey, welcome back in Richards. Carter Wilcoxon coming to you from... uh, some nice, cool Phoenix weather here in the wintertime. Um, I know maybe some of you in Richards that are out there listening on the East Coast. I apologize, but this is why I live in Phoenix and put up with 120 degree temperatures in the summer. So as is normal, I'm joined by my fantastic co-host, Mr. Chemical Free Body himself, Tim James. Tim, how are you doing, my man? Hey, buddy. Doing pretty good. Excited to have our guest on. Um We've actually had some sunshine here for the last four or five days, but it's, you know, 25 degrees <laughs> in the morning. And then it might warm up to like, I don't even know what it is right now. But um, I mean, actually, I'm kind of, I want to look it up. Weather, Legrand, let's see what pops in here. It's 42 degrees right now. Okay. Well, that's not bad. Well, it's funny because, um, you know, as most of our enrichers know, I'm a golf fanatic, right? And so my son, who is an aspiring golfer. He'll be 17 in January. I can't even, can't even believe that. We started playing in this men's group to get him some like more experience and some sort of like under the gun pressure with, you know, different, you know, capabilities in golf, if you will. Um, and, and we're like first ones out in the morning and this last, you know, Sunday morning when we were playing, you know, he's like freezing cold and like, 52 degrees outside right so anyway i just think it's uh it's kind of funny what your perspective is on coldness but then then of course it always warms up and it's 72 degrees you know by you know noon you got it pretty rough but i have to say this i i finally um i'm i'm not gonna be for the next did i tell you about what happened i'm the general manager now for a healing retreat in medellin colombia well no you were telling me a little bit about that uh like a few weeks ago but no, do tell. Yeah, I I went down there to help um help this guy kind of launch his deal, and they were using my products to pre detox people, and then he just basically said, "Why don't you just run this whole place?" Because I was like, "All right, let's do it." <laughs> so I'll be heading back there. So I'll be flying over your head. Um, I just fly from Portland to Miami, and then Miami is a to Medellin's a three and a half hour flight south, and it's like seventy. It's like you know. 60 to 80 degrees all year round. It's pretty awesome. The weather's, it's winter time there now, but it's like, it's nice. It's nice. It's 7,000 uh, feet up in the Andes Mountains. So I'll give a little shout out for what our first signature retreat launches January 20th. And it's at mountainsofhope.com. Okay. And we had an influencers event last week. And every single person came up to me and told me I changed their life. And I think they did that to all of our guests and to the, and the founder. And they probably told him the same thing too. They broke their hearts open. They did physical, emotional work. We had all these different ceremonies. Uh, we have a Temescal where it's a, uh, you know what that is, but it's like, like a fire ceremony where you bring hot rocks into oh. a, like a cavey type thing. Okay. Um, and uh, they do it out in the woods called it a nipi. They put sticks together in a geometric pattern and cover it with blankets. They get in there and it's like a sweat lodge basically is what it is. Um, we do cacao ceremonies. Um, we did, uh, rape ceremony. We have a infinity pool, a hot tub, a cold plunge. We did ice baths. One woman had an emotional breakthrough during the ice bath. We did Soma breath work healing, which people were just like blown away. We did holotropic breath work with the ice baths. Um, we have a Finlandia combo infrared sauna. We have a steam room with eucalyptus that comes into it workout room and carter you're gonna love this ping pong soon to have a pool table we have a professional putting green with the sand trap and you can chip and do all that stuff outside and then inside a full thing it's called track golf and you can do all the courses yeah it's a simulator inside the building it's a pga thing Um, we have a mile and a half walking course around this 20 acre beautiful property uh, we have a three acres of four acres of fresh food we grow. We serve you the food we grow on the property. Um, and the most important thing is we have a loving uh, staff that, and we take care of people. We're only 15 minutes from the airport. We're up in the, we're about 
45 minutes from Medellin, but we're up in a place called Rio Negro and it's like a very, very wealthy area and it's all private and up on the side of a mountain. It's pretty epic, dude. And so right. if anybody's looking to heal themselves of whatever deep, you know, dis-ease they have and emotional trauma, if people broke through and we have 24 more people coming in uh, next week and I'm going to go back down for that one. So we've tripled the size of the group for the next influencer event. Once that's done, then we, we open it up to the public. Wow. Well, uh, enrichers, that is what we're all about here, right? As we say on a regular basis, it doesn't really matter about how much wealth you've got if you don't have your health, right? So so my co-host is all about that. And I'm, I'm very excited about bringing on our guests from really what I think is God's country, Monterey, California, Chris Murray from Hilltop Securities. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you guys for inviting me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. very excited. Well, in Richards, as is normal, what we're going to do is we're going to delve into the backstory of a financial professional like uh, Chris and see what it was that got him where he's at. So, Chris, if you don't mind, you know, talk us, you know, take us back to maybe whatever the infancy was the, or the, you know, the first thing that got you going into the, the path in the financial services business to uh, get you where you're at today. Sure, sure. So I'm going to take you back a little bit before what kind of got me there. So I had a friend who got into the business very young in life. I think he was in his, I think he was around 23 or 24 uh, working as a financial advisor. And I was in a different industry and he kind of helped me with my 401k and planning and all that kind of good stuff. It really got me started on some good habits for a person who didn't have a lot of good habits at that time in my early 20s. <laughs> so I kind of got some excitement about investing in what to invest in. The whole planning for retirement still hadn't kicked in and any of that kind of stuff, but I had uh, a curiosity. So we're going to fast forward to about, oh, seven years after that. And um, you'll be excited about this because I was in the golf business before yeah. I got into this. So what happened was, is me and my wife were expecting our first child and we were about ready to send our newborn basically to childcare. And we decided we couldn't do this. So I quit my job. And became a stay-at-home dad for the first five years of my daughter and then my son, who was born two years after that. So five years of, of staying at home. So um, I grew a lot and learned a lot of interesting things. I was still kind of working some of the golf business. But what happened in that time is I started a golf concierge company. And I used all my connections. I had connections all around the world. I had some connections at your favorite golf courses. And I would set up events, tee times, golf outings, and things of that nature. And, of course, that didn't make it. It <laughs> failed miserably. I basically gave my business away for pennies on the dollar. I didn't know about business. Um, great learning experience. Not fun to go through with a family. So I'm skipping a lot of things there, but what happened was, is I was, as I was looking to kind of go back into the job world, I didn't want to get back into the golf industry. My wife was working a little bit, but had stayed home because the golf concierge thing was working a little bit, but not as great as I thought it was. So she actually talked to the friend of mine and about me doing what I was going to do as an advisor. And him and another gentleman basically were saying, hey, you would be good at this. You know customer service. You have an affinity to work with people. You have a liking to what you do. You like the investment part. Why don't you give this a try? And I thought about it and I was like, ah, I don't know. And um, my wife basically called me and said, hey, I talked to your friend, Brandon. You need to do this. I said, okay. So fast forward, he introduced me to one of the places where I started. The branch manager hired me, and I was off to the races. So what excited me about it was, one, I could make and kind of create my own business. 
I get to work and connect with people. And I had an excitement and an affinity to kind of learn about the investing world. And that kind of what got me going. And of course, then once you start, the reality begins. <laughs> <laughs> then, then you realize just how competitive that industry is, right? Just how competitive is. And my, my favorite joke is, what is the difference between an extra large pizza and a new financial advisor? I'm ready. The extra large pizza can eat, feed a family of five. <laughs> so I definitely was indoctrinated into something that I wasn't ready for and learned to go through it to reap the rewards that, of course, that I'm reaping now. But it was a lot of cold calling, a lot of being uncomfortable, a lot of adversity. It really taught me to learn how to be authentic with myself and with other people. And that would lead me to success more than what I know, how smart I am, how right I am. But it was more that authenticity of who I was and how I conveyed my message to people. That's awesome. So you mentioned, you know, pre-show you weren't, you're in Monterey, California now, but I think you mentioned that you were in Eagle, Colorado. Do I remember that right? Is was some of this going on then, and then you eventually ended up in California, or how did that transition happen? Sure. So I started in California. So I started in the industry in, I think, 06 or 05. And then my wife got an opportunity in Colorado in 2010. So we moved from here to Colorado. So I was already in the business. I went independent on a platform with my company, and we were in Colorado. And then in 2000 and uh, 17, 18, we moved back here for a business opportunity with the firm I am with now. Gotcha. And then, um, so you start this golf concierge thing. I want to go back to that a little bit because, sure. you know, that, that was something that obviously you were attracted to that. It, it was, there something that you, did you play like high school golf, college golf or something like that? And you just wanted to be in that industry or did you think that it was just a good money-making opportunity? No, I played golf when I was younger. Growing up here, I played all the courses you love. <laughs> um, I wasn't on the high school golf team. I played a lot of other sports, and I played some other sports in junior college. But when I got into the golf business because of a friend of mine who I played golf with as a younger kid, um, I was looking for a job, and this golf course was looking for caddies, so I started back in as a caddy. And I worked my way up to be the first assistant. So I basically was teaching and being inside a golf shop. And I, I, I loved golf, so I enjoyed doing that. Um, I did also calligraphy scoreboards, you know, the fancy things. So I got paid to do that. Yeah. So I did all that. So what I, when I got into the golf concierge business, it was kind of just happenstance because I would just get all these people that I knew – um, ex-members and people calling me, hey, can you get this guy on or do you have a caddy or hey, um, you know, can you help us out? And I would help them out. And somebody said, well, you should start getting paid for this. And I said, okay. So I started paying for it. So my, my claim to fame was, is that I got this one person on to Pebble Beach before Pebble Beach got him on and he was staying there. Wow. <laughs> So, and I liked that. I liked helping people to go and do things like that. I liked the customer service aspect. I liked people to feel like they were having fun and having the time of their life. And so that's kind of what I thought this concierge business would do. And that's kind of how I feel with what I do in my advisory role too, is I want to be a safe place. I want people to come to me. I want to educate them. I try to help them get over their fear of economic insecurity um, because it doesn't matter how much or how little you have, you can still have economic insecurity. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely no doubt about that. So, you know, you're mentioning about all the golf courses that I love. It was interesting just yesterday, you know, a little sidebar here, I guess. I belong to a, uh, a networking group called Epic Golf Club, and mm -hmm. they sent out a message, you know, via text to everybody that – there was uh, the bids were opened up for four spots, you know, on an individual basis, right? Uh, to Cypress Point, and I'm like, 
are you kidding me right now? So <laughs> my question there is, have you played Cypress Point? Several times, yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Tim James, you have no idea how jealous I am right now of this guy. <laughs> you got no idea. So, yeah. so one, of, one of our previous guests that's been on this podcast is a PGA Tour winner. Shout out to Charlie Belgian, which uh, if, if you and Richard have not listened to that or if you have not listened to that episode with Charlie Belgian on here, um, you got to listen to it because he talks about a lot of the anxiety and the health issues that he went through when he was on the PGA Tour. Well, right he was now, hanging out with John Daly. What do you expect? Hanging out with John Daly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but what's awesome is right now he's been sober. He just had 36 months of sobriety. He is at Q school right now. So, you know, I'm obviously, you know, rooting for him, you know, big time. The point about Cypress Point, though, is um, I was talking to him on the podcast. He had a Cypress Point shirt on whenever we were recording him on there. And he said he just got a chance to play there like in it was November of this time, like last year. And like PGA Tour player is just now getting a chance to play Cypress Point. So I'm super jealous of you, Chris. Yeah, I've been very fortunate. I also worked with a company. Um, I put golf tours on to Scotland and Ireland, so I've got to play a lot of those golf courses. So I'm I'm, I'm very, very grateful to have played some really wonderful courses and meet some wonderful people and hear some great stories. And golf gave me a lot. Um, it was a tough business. Um, I can relate to your former guest. Um, so it's uh, – um, but it gave me a lot of what I needed actually to to work in this in this industry as well. I, I definitely piggybacked um, with, you know, giving lessons, um, you know, managing tour, you know, not tour events, but member events or, you know, LPGA qualifiers or PGA qualifiers, things like that. So um, I learned a lot that helped me um, in what I do today and handling a lot of stress and anxiety, um, yeah. which I'll. I think it's I think it's really cool that um that you took care of your kids as a stay at home mom. I actually did that when my son was born um uh, for the first year or two and um it's like it's going outside the conventional box of like what's supposed to happen and stuff like that. But um I mean, changing diapers every two hours maybe not the funnest thing in the world, but you know, you, you get to see what it's like to take care of a child at that level. And, and, you know, there's obviously some good uh, bonding and connection you get with the child doing that stuff. So anyway, I think that's cool. And I, it looks like that's trickled into your financial practice. So we're going to take a quick break. We get back, we'll find out exactly what Chris is doing over there in his financial practice to help people keep their money safe and, and growing. We'll be right back. Estate planning. What does that even mean? When the inevitable happens for everyone on this planet, your estate plan kicks into action. But first, let's start with what an estate is. An estate is simply everything you own. Now, here's the issue and what needs to be understood when this event occurs. You only have two choices on this plan. Number one, either you plan how your estate gets handed out and distributed to those you leave behind. Or number two, your state decides who gets everything you own. For the first time ever, you can now take complete and total control of this plan that you've been deprived of for most of your life and generations before you. You can get personalized assistance along the way with a team of specialists whose job it is to make sure you have true peace of mind. It's important to understand that estate planning is a journey and rest assured that our team will be available to you all along the way and at every step. Welcome to eState Plan, home of the last estate plan you'll ever need. To learn more, make sure to reach out to your local advisor licensed with us or go to our website for more information. What's up, in Richards? Tim James here. I'm back with my co-host, Carter Wilcoxon. Today in the house, we've got Chris Murray. Chris, why don't you just tell us all about your practice and what, what you're doing to love on your clients over there and, and why do they stay around? Uh, what are you doing? Man, I don't know. I don't know if I'm any different than anybody else, but I try to share my experience with them. I want them to feel I'm a safe place. You know, I, I really try to make connections with people and let them know that we're here for them to go through the ups and downs, 
times where there's, gosh, uh, you know, a lot of insecurity because at the end of the day, we, you know, we have all the financial plans and the strategies and, you know, the balancing and the rebalancing of the portfolios. But when it comes down to it, when somebody's in a not comfortable place, they need to feel safe. And that's what we try to do is let them know they're part of a community that they may not see and, and talk to everybody, but we're all there for them. And we just want them to know that we can get them through any of the tough times um, that they may be going through. So, yeah, so you're, it sounds like your clients, you know, they, they trust you, right? And, you know, as the saying goes, people do business with those that they know they like and they and they trust. And you're very much, you know, relationship manager, managing expectations and being that relationship builder with them that ultimately helps them, you know, feel comfortable in some of those uncomfortable situations that obviously the markets with the ebbs and flows can bring. Exactly. And I think education is important and we can dive deep in the weeds as they want, but an education of their investment and their portfolio, I think is extremely helpful. It's not just one month I look at my account, it's up great. Next month it's down. It's, you know, why do we have these investments in there? What are they? When times are bad, can you go to the grocery store and see that you own a company that's in there and people are buying it? So sometimes when you understand what you own in a portfolio and why, and why there might be times it goes up and down, you have a better understanding of of the whole picture as opposed to, oh my gosh, it's down. Oh my God, I'm scared. But no, Chris told me about this. Hey, I have these companies. They're big, they're broad, they pay dividends or whatever. And yes, this is going to get me to my goals. And yes, I have to remember that, you know, being invested in quote unquote, the market is like walking up a flight of stairs, carrying a yo-yo. The yo-yos, the up and downs day to day and the stairs are the long term. Yeah, I, I like that. So, so just out of curiosity, let's talk a little bit about what does your clientele uh, look like, you know, as far as like demographics and, you know, age demographics and, and things of that nature. Because the area that you live in, very affluent area, right? Probably lots of right. ultra high net worth and high net worth clients, and everything super competitive to try to, you know, cultivate these relationships. So so share a little bit with the Richards, like what does your uh, makeup of the demographic you work with, uh, the ideal types of clients? Sure. And I, I have clients all over the country too. They're not just here in, in California. So uh, I'm very fortunate to that, with that. So my demographic is probably, you know, I haven't really looked at it in a deep dive, um, but I would say they're middle age to above middle age, kind of coming into that retirement years or in those retirement years. But I also work with some people who are just starting out or starting to build their wealth too. So I kind of try to look for and work with clients who are serious about their investing and getting to where they need to be. Um, so I don't know if that's a, do I have a, a quote unquote minimum or a type? It's, it's I want to work with someone who um, wants and appreciates help on their journey. So uh, that's kind of what I look for. In my early days, when I first started, you know, there was a lot of cold calling on municipal bonds. So tax-free municipal bonds. That was, I, I love things that pay and I love things that pay tax-free. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, so, we're, a big, we're a big fan of the concept around here. We, In fact, my business partner um, has a, a saying that he's coined, divorcing the IRS, right? So uh, as much as we can do that, that typically, it's not how much you make, it's how much you get to keep, right? So Exactly. Big, big fans of that concept. Um, so you talked just a little bit about, uh, you know, just now how you've got some clients all over, you know, the country and you've been doing this for almost two decades now, right? That's how. Yeah. About 17 years, I would say. Yeah. Sneaking up on that. So was it a, talk a little bit about some of maybe either the challenges or opportunities that presented itself with COVID and and I would assume since you've got some clients all over the country, maybe that was a some somewhat of an opportunistic. Yeah. So, you know, some of the people, of course, moved out of the state. Right. So they were in the state um, and then some were just referrals from people that just happened to live out of state. So during covid, um, 
it didn't disrupt that much. Um, it was just more of an annoyance or a nuisance, I would say, because of certain things. But a lot of my business was done over the phone. Um, so I just was working at home more as opposed to in the office. And um, there's pluses and minuses with that, as everybody knows. But course, yeah. um, I- I'm very grateful that I could still work with my clients in those situations you know, being able to Zoom or Microsoft Teams or things like this, right? It accentuated all this to help me to be able to help those people. And the opportunities with that, absolutely. Because if I had like a a elevator pitch, it's basically I work with individuals, families, and businesses who want to make an impact and leave a legacy. And you can decide what an impact means to you and you can decide what a legacy means to you, but it's important to you. And I think that is what was conveyed to some of these people in different areas that said, Hey, let's give Chris Murray a try and let's see what he can do and help us. And, you know, some people I can help some people I can, if we're a fit, we're a fit. I just want to work with people who um, would appreciate that. And, and I appreciate them. So. Yeah. And it sounds like that's exactly what's happening. So um, is there like a, uh, like what is success, you know, from, you know, from your perspective, what does success kind of look like? You know, is it, is it about how much AUM that you kind of have and you, and you're doing a good job there, or is it, do you really kind of consider the amount of clients that refer you maybe it becomes more of your success measure? Oh, that's a great question because you were in an industry where it's, about money, right? Sure. And it's about bigger. So I, I think sometimes you battle those kind of questions for yourself. But for me, um, success is being able to, of course, take care of those clients, meet some of the expectations of the firm have for me, right? Um, and they meet some of my expectations too. So it's me just kind of checking my motives and how I work with people and what I am for them. And if I continue to grow, great, but it's not because to grow for growth reasons. It's to grow because that's the direction that I need to go. Because at the end of the day, I want to be able to service everybody the way I service one. Sure. Yeah. And if I can't do that, then it's it's kind of stressful for me. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Defeating the purpose of what you're trying to accomplish, right? Exactly. Exactly. So yes, there's some uh, goals that I want to to reach, but I've noticed in this business, uh, be careful what you wish for. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I've got this, um, I got this thing where some of the coaching that I do as an advisor to advisors and everything, you know, I talk about how what you're really trying to create is as many 4A clients as possible, right? And I, I specifically, the four A's are the right type of attitude with aptitude who have the proper amount of assets who can become an advocate for you. Right. And if you can create, if you can have that in sort of like a, as a, as your own measure or a gauge, I guess, of who you're trying to work with. I know that a lot of the advisors that, I, that I've shared that with, you know, that, that helps them to kind of sort of have a little bit better focus on who they're trying to work with so that they're not trying to be everything to everybody, but everything to some that fit, fit that because, as you know, if you can grow your practice from advocacy, right? I mean, you talked a little bit about it, you know, referrals, you're, you're getting referred, but really ideally you want them advocating for you. Like they can't help, but to introduce you to those that they are connected to, right? Cause that, that's how you really, and, and, the, and the reason why I was asking about how do you look at success? I think that's a great way to sort of like gauge it. If you're getting lots of introductions, you're successful and you're doing right by those current clients who then, can introduce you to some of those uh, new clients. Yeah, exactly. And I, I like the way you put that, the advocacy, um, the attitude. That's exactly true. Because someone, someone asked me once, you know, what is your ideal client and who are your ideal clients? And, you know, is it money and things like this? And And I said, it's really simple. If the phone rings and I see the name on there and I want to answer it, <laughs> that's the client that I want to work with. <laughs> <laughs> and, and vice versa right as as a client you're like oh chris is calling me 
Send them a voicemail, right? Exactly, exactly. And I've had, you know, a lot of people say a lot of nice things. I think one of the best compliments is, you know, uh, clients have said I was their life coach of financial because I really get deep into just the whole mechanics of investing and not just the X's and O's, but understanding how they think about money, um, you know, kind of the psychology of it, because that's going to make most of their investment decisions. So, and not everybody wants that kind of it, right? Um, But some people want that sense of community and that sense of connection. And to me, that's really important because it's more than just the X's and O's. I want to be a part of that and not just surface level. Well, and I love what you talked to, you know, a little bit about, about being impactful and that's different for everybody. Leaving a legacy, that's a little bit different for everybody. Right. But, but if that, if that's kind of sort of like the foundational, you know, idea around what it is that you're doing, I, I think you're definitely on the, on the right track um, because people have this sense of wanting to, to leave a legacy, right. They have a sense of, they want to leave some sort of an impact, you know, and, and leave the place better than you found it, so to speak, right? That that idea. And I would venture a guess that that's the type of clientele that you're working with. Yeah, I do. And, you know, I've seen it too with, with clients that um, maybe I wasn't working with their parents, but they've come to me and, you know, the gratitude that they have for what their parents did, um, you know, sometimes blows me away. Like when a, a client that I have got an inheritance and could not believe what her mother had saved for her. I mean, she, every time we talk, she's just is blown away and just so grateful. And I love to see that. And it is that, doesn't is that gal, about... is that gal single? <laughs> <laughs> well, she is, um, uh, <laughs> but you know, that's kind of cool to watch or, you know, working with someone who they're the first persons in their family to save for retirement. Right. That could be just as little as that. Right. Um, So it's it's so interesting that it's more than just the investment process. And it can be so much deeper and so much more satisfying for the person. I feel when they understand all that information, not just X's and O's, my accounts up. I'm excited. My accounts down. Oh, my gosh, I'm scared. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, I normally, and, and I see that we're coming up a, a, against the clock for the next break, but I have one other thing that I wanted to to bring up. Normally, I would have done this in the, in the first uh, segment, but I'm going to go ahead and do it now. You know, the the most important thing, because you're obviously an entrepreneur, right? You started this golf concierge business. Someone gave you an idea. You're like, oh, yeah, I think I can do that. So being a financial professional is probably, arguably, one of the scariest things because you eat what you kill, Right. So my question is, how important has your spouse been in that journey with the support that I know is hugely necessary for me on my end with my spouse? Uh, It's extremely important. Um, We make a great team. She was soft when she needed to be and extremely direct and to the point when she needed to be. Um, I'm very fortunate. Uh, You know, the things worked out the way they did. I was able to grow slowly because she had a job that that paid most of the bills. We moved to to Eagle, so it gave me the opportunity to grow slowly. Um, So, yes, without her and that support and as well as the reality checks, um, I wouldn't be able to make it and still continue to do it. Yeah. Well, that is that's important. Um, You either need to be single or have a supportive spouse when you get started. (laughs) Yeah, there's no you just you just rock. never get you just never give up. I mean, that's the thing. If you just never get but you finally figure it out and you help enough people. And you know, I was thinking about what Carter said, it's like eat what you kill, and it's like I totally resonate with that being a hunter, I growing up in eastern Oregon and stuff like that. But the reality is is like maybe we should change our language a little bit on that and be more like, you know, it's the highest paying hard work, the lowest paying easy work. That's another way of looking at it, but why does it have to be hard? Why can't it be fun? Um, you know, financial advising is like pretty much everything else. It's like universal principles. What you put out is what you get back. If you show up every day and you're generally interested in learning, figuring out the industry, because when you walk into the industry, nobody knows anything. Like when yeah. I walked in, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, I got into it so I could make a lot of residual income. That's why I got into it. 
But then when I got in there, I'm like, uh, a lot of these things that people are doing with their money is not good for the client. And so like I had to spend, luckily I had a guy, a mentor that helped me navigate how to actually do it correctly. Right. And then, and then serve clients. And I, I was very fortunate to be with a guy that at the time had, you know, he'd been a business, I don't even, 10 years, he'd never lost a person's a dime of anybody's money. Hard to say in this industry, right? And a great guy. So anyway, maybe we should look at just loving on people, doing a good job. And if you stick around long enough, you know, it everything will just work out and it takes care of you. So, all right. So we're going to take another break and then we get back. We'll, um, we'll flip the script and let Chris ask me any question he has on health when we return. We'll be right back. You want the absolute best for yourself and you want it to be easy. That's why we created Green 85. It helps with detoxifying the body gently. We're proud it's chemical free, unlike almost all other supplements you'll find. Bottom line, Green 85 will get you healthier. We look forward to hearing what Green 85 did for you. To get this product and our other amazing products, go to chemicalfreebody.com. That's chemicalfreebody.com. What's up, Enrichers? Tim James here. I'm back with my co-host, Carter Wilcoxon. All right, Chris, this is the part where we uh, we switch from talking about, we, we talked about your past, uh, we talked about financial services, wealth building, and now we get to talk about the health side of things. The most important part, because without it, it doesn't really matter how much money you have. What's your question, sir? So, questions that I have, since you are very familiar with this business and have probably worked with people in this business, what have you found to be the most detrimental thing to some stress? And what is your way of giving education on how to deal with that? Um, Usually I set financial advisors down and I slap their ego right off their face, number one. Perfect. Um, That's most important uh, because the ego is, uh, well, first off, you know, people really don't even have an awareness around it, especially the A types like, Oh, just pile it on. I can handle it. Just throw everybody on. I'll carry everybody to the finish line. I can do it all. Um, especially when you have your own private practice and you're trying to do everything yourself and you're wearing all those hats. So stress is the number one killer. Um, even in, you know, Western medicine, there's many sites out there that'll show you it's, it's taking nine to 17 years off of your lifespan. Right. That's, that's, that's a chunk, right? So, um, that's a lot of years you could have some compound interest going with your money if, we, <laughs> if your money's more important to you than you. But hopefully, uh, you know, it's just waking people up to the fact that stress is killing us and it's not giving us a quality of life, you know. And I'll tell the shortened version of it because I think I told the bunny rabbit story not too long ago, didn't I, Carter? You did. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's it's a good refresher, but if there's a rabbit, the bunny rabbit's out in the clover patch eating clover he's in rest and digest mode okay his blood has left his legs it's into his his gut and he's chilled out when the fox comes to eat him his cortisol spikes his adrenaline spikes and he dashes into the briar patch and he just narrowly avoids being lunch himself Uh, his eyes are bugged out his heart rate and his breathing's elevated he went into fight or flight aka sympathetic nervous system mode so those chemicals that were generated, the cortisol and the adrenaline that were generated from him trying to save his life because digestion didn't really matter at that point in time. He was going to be eaten if he didn't get out of there. So all those chemicals were released so he could be super rabbity and get out of there, which he did. And he burned through those chemicals. The difference is, is that the financial advisors you're talking about, when they wake up from the time they start till they finish, they're under constant stress from the alarm clock ringing, the the spouse, financial stress, the kids, uh, you know, we're talking about um, so many uh, people are taking care of their parents nowadays with dementia and Alzheimer's and autism, all the different things are going on and financial stress and COVID stress, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of stress, right? And trying to make sure that, you know, you're crossing all the T's and dotting the I's so the SEC doesn't take your license away. So you have all these things going on 
and they're all foxes and they're all spiking your cortisol and your adrenaline but as the advisor you you don't you don't take off running and you don't fight anything so you don't burn those chemicals up and they become toxic poisons that slowly destroy your health and kill you literally and right. you're going to age 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 much faster you're going to look much older i see this a lot where the advisors um are married to a typically like a woman their age if they if they met them in like high school but the man looks a lot older than his wife and i see that a lot Have you guys seen that same age, but the the guy looks older. In some uh, aspects, you know, older than my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, some guys rebooted and got a younger wife too, so <laughs> that does happen. But I'm talking about. I'm just saying it's like it stresses the number one killer. So number one is like just recognizing that it's real. Right. What is it? And then having daily strategies to mitigate that stress. And the number one thing is just like learning how to respond differently to the sim- situations. How you respond is going to dictate how those chemicals are uh, being created or not created in your body. And if they are created, it'd probably be a good idea to move your body. You know, take a walk, get out there, move, shake, shake it off, you know. Um, But, you know, breath work, meditation, prayer, reading books, far infrared saunas to calm your nervous system, Carter. Um, You know, getting outside in nature, going for walks, being around people that you love. Um, Just realizing that life is too short, and if you're going to be here, why stress yourself out? Because all you can do is do your best, so why get stressed out about anything? And even if somebody's a jerk or jerkette towards you, you don't don't bring it on. It's like that's their crap. That's their baggage they're trying to throw up on you. So let them do that, and it's like – and open your heart and be compassionate towards them. Then you don't don't stress out about that stuff. No, that's good points, and I've tried to make that – some daily practices. Like I, I get up pretty early. I work out. Um, I journal. I have some things that I read every day. I do have some meditation, um, practices. So I, I, I found that extremely important. So I'm glad I do things like that. Um, but the way you put it and hearing it again is always nice and clear. Do I get to ask no. one more? Do I get to ask sure. another question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So the other question I have is, um, I'm 54 and, I'm pretty good shape, pretty active, but do you have like balance exercises that you'd say, Hey, you know, you're getting older start working on some coordination, some balance exercises. I started doing some things like that, but wanted to get your take on some non-conventional, you know, riding, running, lifting weights, but just some balancing and maybe some transitional exercises to help to keep some of that, uh, high school memory of how good my coordination was. <laughs> yeah. Well, the first thing I'm thinking of is, is yoga. Number one, there's some great okay. balancing postures in yoga. Eagle pose is one of them. Right. If you've done that before. Um, there's just, I mean, the Bikram yoga series has a lot of balancing postures in there. You might want to look into Bikram yoga. Okay. If you did that at least God, two, three days a week. That'd be fantastic for so many other things too. Um, and, and then there's, um, you know, a lot of people do everything they do, they do directionally in front of them, and they forget to move side to side. That's really going to help your coordination. So doing side lunges and side jumps and stuff, and not just focusing linearly in front of you, but also working to the side, um, uh, you know, and having somebody like just every, just operate from the side. Move your body side to side. You can do shuffles and stuff like that. And then there's balancing postures. You've probably also heard of like um, plyometrics. Mm-hmm. You don't need to do a 42 inch box and start there, but just just up and down. But also doing those plyometrics to the left and to the right, and that starts giving you that 360 coordination. But I, I really like um, yoga poses and Bikram yoga for that kind of stuff because I mean you got to focus. You have to focus. Another thing you can do too is just do exercises. You can get like a thick piece of foam. And stand on that, and that will make you um, oscillate a little bit, and it really gets you focusing on um, and doing stuff like just lifting one leg up behind you while you're balancing on one, or closing your eyes a little bit, and it starts. It, it just it works, right? So those those are some mechanical things um, that you can do, and I think that's about it on that. Cool. Yeah, those are actually a couple of questions, Tim. I don't think we really had anybody ask us about. Mm-mm. balance before so it's it's nice to 
you know, get something a little bit different this time. So, you know, thanks. Yeah. For great. Question. Yeah. Great, no great question. And, you know, people have to pay attention to this stuff, especially as you get older and just, here's the deal is like sports, uh, you know, physiotherapists and stuff like that, that have been doing this work for 50 years will tell you that if you're 35 and younger, you know, you need to be stretching three days a week. If you're 35 and older, it's daily. You have to right. do it every day. Otherwise, you're going to start regressing. You need to move it or you lose it. Um, weight resistance exercise, you know, at a bare minimum. I mean, you got to do it. I mean, because uh, three days a week for an hour. I mean, that's that's what's actually required. Now, there there's hacks now around that. I've hacked my way around that stuff. But um, with resistance bands, I mean, you can get the the load on the bones and the stuff like that to strengthen your bones and create stem cells. And you can also, you know, you want to keep your muscle mass, obviously, but you know, these are just things you have to do. Otherwise you're going to atrophy and you're not going to have, be as strong and you won't be able to do these coordination exercises. So we have to keep that up and we're always rehabilitating ourselves because, you know, if you don't move, you know, it's, it's going to go away. I just experienced my mom fell earlier, uh, eight months ago or so. And she was in bed for almost three months and her body atrophied tremendously. Now we finally found a really good physical therapist and she's coming out three days a week. And my mom's like, man, she's tough. And it's like, yeah, cause she's, <laughs> she's pushing her. Right. But we already like just in the last God month since that gal's been working with her, like the pictures, the before and after pictures, her posture, her ability to get around. She's out of the bedroom now more. She's sitting back out on the couch up, or the, the chair up front, moving around, doing stuff. Sometimes I got to get her to comp. Hey, slow down. We, you're not there yet because you're going to cause yourself more pain. But tremendous benefit by simply stretching and moving her body. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to ask you a question, Chris. Actually, because you you talked, you know, um, you know, pre-show for sure. You just had a hip replacement about a year ago, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so what has that like rehab been as far as like stretching and and all that? I mean. I'm 52 in January, so I'm sneaking up on you. I'm right, right behind you. And I've never had like any kind of hip issues. So I'm just wondering, you know, what you preventatively could have done to not have to deal with that, that I might be able to, you know, glean from you. Well, I, I don't know if I had anything preventative um, happen. I think it was just a lot of years of certain things. And um, I, I wouldn't say that I was a runner, but I used to like to test myself. Um, so I started having some hip issues that I didn't know were hip issues. I did a, um, I did a 50 K run. And after that thing started to feel different and anyways, it progressed. So I got to a point where I went to somebody and they said, Hey, what do you think is happening? And I said, it feels like if I had arthritis, this is what arthritis would feel like. And they said, yes, I was basically bone on bone. I probably could have went a little bit longer, but I had it done. And, um, I just followed the doctor's game plan in recovery. Um, I started right away with icing and doing everything they told me. I went into uh, physical therapy. I actually started preparing before the surgery. I started getting myself, I I work out regularly, but I started getting myself in better stretching shape. Like Tim was saying, just those kind of things. Mm. And then in the physical therapy, just following the directions and doing what they told me to do and not going up and beyond. And um, I think that helped in me progressing and getting to a point where I can do some of the things where I couldn't do before that don't cause me any pain. So I I just followed the process um, with the physical therapy to get me back and not doing too much and, trying to be a hero and I'm going to get back here, but I had to learn a lot of patience. I had to bite my lip a lot because I wanted to go, 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 go. Um, but I just followed the process. Nice. What, which is exactly what you coach and teach your client <laughs> to do, right? Just, just follow my process and you'll be successful. Just follow the process. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All too often. I mean, I think, I think trust the process is exactly what, Nick Saban talked about in an interview, however long ago it was, right? Which is pretty normal. Just, just, you got to trust the process, right? You just got to keep doing those types of things. So, uh, Hey, and Richard, we really thank you for joining us for another episode of the health and wealth podcast. 
And uh, and for you to be able to see all of our other previous guests, like Chris Murray from Hilltop Securities, you can go to our website at www.thehealthandwealthpodcastshow.com and make sure to like, share, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Podbean, whatever the case may be. So for my fantastic co-host, Mr. Chemical Free Body himself, Tim James, I'm Carter Wilcox, the CEO and founder of Epic Services Company and CSI Financial Group. Thank you for joining us today again. Um, Chris, seriously, thank you so much. I know it was a labor of love almost being able to get you on the show. We're so thankful that we finally pressed through and got all those things. And, and, and we really do appreciate you coming on today. No, I really enjoyed that. I thank you for your time. It's really good to, to meet you both and, and share this experience. So, yeah, looking forward to chatting with you guys down the road. All right. Sounds great. Hey, and Richards, until next time, we will see you on the Health and Wealth Podcast. Thank you, everybody. Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Health and Wealth Podcast with your hosts, Tim and Carter. What's trending in Richards? Carter Wilcox, founder of CSI Financial Group here with my co-host and former wealth advisor, Tim James, founder of chemicalfreebody.com and your new health advisor. This is the show where we reveal the connection between physical and financial abundance.